Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, meet again with uh, Dr. Warjo in Warjo TV channel. Uh, today uh, we have a special guest because uh, my guest is uh, the professor is I think very famous in the United States and many books that has written. So today I will to discuss with him in the beautifully uh, his home and the beautifully library than the place that uh, we could uh, discuss with him. So uh, in this time, I will to discuss with him about the new books that uh, many scholars discuss it. And of course, I agree, like uh, John S. Posito said, the one of the book that we must read is the Islam and the Good Governance by Yes M A uh, Muktadar Khan. Oh. I know many uh, scholar as uh, reading this book, and of course for me, uh, I have many time uh, reading this book, and of course great books. So in this time, thank you very much uh, for the time, Prof Khan that you uh, present in uh, my YouTube uh, channel, Warjo TV, and hopefully uh, I could and got uh, many things about the issue, about the, what you have written in this book, because we want to know about the uh, many things that you have written in Islam and good uh, governance, uh, political philosophy of Islam. Okay, we will going to uh, Many question, of course. I give you uh, maybe in a uh, question, but depend on you to uh, answer uh, my question. Okay, uh, are you ready? Prof. I'm Khan? ready. I'm ready. Thank you so much for the time. Okay, uh, one question is: uh, Please tell me why are you writing uh, books Islam and governance. A political philosophy of Islam. Well, thank you, Wario, for inviting okay. me to your show. Assalamu alaikum to all your listeners in Malik Indonesia. I have visited Indonesia, and uh, there are uh, lots of people, people who do work on pluralism and thank Islam you. and yes. democracy, who are familiar with my work. Uh, I even met Nur Khalish Majid ah, once. Nice, I nice. picked him up at the airport drove him to Georgetown, hung out with him for two or three days, and then drove him back uh, at the airport. So I'm familiar with uh, Indonesia. I've traveled there. And I'm also familiar with some of the scholars of Indonesia. Uh, as far as uh, those of you who don't know Professor Wario, who may be watching this uh, video because you're my friend or my student, Professor Wario is a distinguished uh, professor of International Relations in Indonesia. He's visiting the United States uh, as an invitee uh, of the State Department to participate in a seven-week study of U.S. foreign policy. He's frequently on Indonesian TV, and he's a rising superstar, a public intellectual in Indonesia. So I feel and quite shall, honored uh, to be in present. Thank you. Bro. People don't realize that given the fact that the largest Muslim population is in Indonesia. Yeah. If you're a superstar in Indonesia, you're Mashallah. probably the bigger superstar <laughs> in the Muslim world than anywhere else. Thank you. So as far as this book is concerned, I love books. And uh, I find it very interesting mm. that this is the Sunnah of God that oh, we emulate. God wrote four books. Yeah, I see. And, uh, and so I, li I like to write books. I love books. I like to read books. Uh, and uh, if you notice, that sometimes the word kitab in Arabic means many oh, things. Nice, it also nice. just other than books. So there is a, a mystical connection to books. There is an intellectual connection. And I just love growing up. I used to read lots of books. And I cannot tell you what incredible joy I get uh, by just the idea that I have written <laughs> yes. five books, right? Hopefully many more before my time is over. But why did I write this book? If you look at the title, it says Islam and yeah. Good Governance, a Political Philosophy of Ihsan. Uh, the, there's a lot of interesting stuff about political philosophy of Ihsan. But the fundamental reason is because I want to change the discussion in the Muslim world from this obsession with Islamic State. 
when people talk about the Islamic State, whether it is Islamic Caliphate or this or that, the focus is on structure. They are obsessed with the structure of the Islamic State. In the modern era, they are trying to replicate something that was uh, in very rural yeah, uh, Arabia in medieval ages. Yes. That structure cannot be reproduced in the modern age. So I want to take the conversation away from structure and towards governance. Mm -hmm. And I want people to say, look, I don't care what the structure of the state is. I don't care whether it's a monarchy or a democracy uh, or a hybrid regime, but can it provide Islamic governance? That is the question I would like people to ask. Not that, oh, is the caliph able to recite the Quran? Muhammad Morsi had memorized the Quran, so people were excited. It doesn't matter whether he's memorized the Quran or not. Is he able to deliver governance? And governance can be as trivial as taking care of the potholes on your street uh, and as profound as providing a vision for your people going forward. And so it requires a lot of thinking, a lot of understanding of the circumstances in which you live, the resources that are available. So I want to move the discussion away, number one, from the structure of the state to governance. Mm -hmm. And good governance is already a developing science. There are lots of criteria. So what is good governance from an Islamic perspective? The second thing is that I also want people to move away from this obsession with law. I see. Law is supposed to serve society. Muslims are the only people on earth who have a law but no society. So they're looking for a country where Islamic law can be implemented. Do you see? Mm. They have a law which they don't want to change or look at it critically. And so they're trying to fit it in some country somewhere. And there's, we have 55 Muslim majority countries in this world and Islamic law is not yeah, fitting see, yes. <laughs> anywhere else yes. because they're going the wrong way. They're putting the cart in front of the horse. So what Muslims need to do is to take a society wherever they are, whether they are in Indonesia mm. or America, and simply ask the question, what is the best way to provide governance to this society so that most people can be happy, can be safe, and can have a free environment where they can fully realize their natural potential. You want to be a good Muslim? Great. We, you can be that in the US. You want to be a Sufi? You can be that in the United States in a democratic society which gives you freedom of religion, etc. So I think Muslims should try to create a society which fits our time and place mm. and try to give people the opportunity to fulfill their full potential and not try to impose their laws and try to create and produce a particular type of individual. So that is the purpose of uh, Islam and good governance. And one final point before you go to the next question. There's a very famous hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he says, Kataba Allah wal ihsan ala kulli shay. God has commanded that you do ihsan in every aspect of life. Right? So even yeah. when you sacrifice an animal, do it with ihsan. So ihsan means to do things beautifully. So my question is, if the Prophet has asked us to do everything in a beautiful way, then what would be a beautiful way to do politics? So this book is about bringing aesthetics mm -hmm. into politics. It's about bringing a beautiful way of governing. It's not easy to do. Even I can't live up to the values I have described in this book. But to me, it's an aspirational model. I want mm. to set the benchmark of what. So for example, if you are governing and say, we have a problem on our southern border, we have millions and millions of refugees who are trying to get into the country and seeking support, and maybe the country can't afford to that. So you ask yourself, what would be the Ahsan policy? What would be the yeah. most beautiful way of dealing with this problem? And then be embarrassed and ashamed and sorry and apologetic that you can't do the best thing and then do. So don't be proud of that. Uh, and uh, one more comment I want to make, if you listen to sermons, uh, most sermons uh, or khutbahs yeah. end with, Inna Allah ya'amuru bil adli wal ihsan. Indeed, yes. God has commanded ihsan with justice. Mm -hmm. So my argument is Muslims miss the first part. God is saying that justice is not enough. You have to be compassionate, loving, tolerant, accepting, and that is better than justice. So this yeah. obsession that uh, advocates of the Islamic State have that we need to implement Sharia in order to have justice, I think is completely wrong. And this is the point of this book. This is my response to 9-11. 
This is my response to the rise of Islamic resurgence in the last 150 years. And I argue actually that they have misled Muslims over 150 years. Their rejection of modernity uh, and their misunderstanding of modernity is one of the reasons why we have these problems in the Muslim world. Oh, it's nice. Uh, I think uh, we got many things here. Uh, why a prop can did the uh, writing book about the uh, Islam and governance, a political philosophy of Islam, not just about the uh, Islam politic, but uh, related with the cases, not just in uh, United States, but in the world, that the point is, I think it's very important how the writer, uh, what is the background, what's the issue did uh, writing about uh, his book. Okay, Prop, uh, in your book, I mean Islam in governance. Exactly in the page uh, 61, 61. So, yeah, 61, okay, you wrote the best way to think of traditional Islam is to imagine Muslim society unsullied by modernity. So what this means? So I argue that there have been broadly four yeah. responses by Muslims to the advent of modernity. I see. One is a secular model, which mm. was adopted by Turkey and Ataturk. They thought that Islam was a source of backwardness, and so they wanted to abandon. They pretended to be Europeans. Oh, and right. Of course, Europe rejected them. They rejected mm -hmm. Islam, and Europe rejected them. I'm not interested in the Turkish model. I think it failed. And Tunisia also practiced that kind of secularism, rejecting Islam. I don't advocate that. Then there are other three responses that Muslims came up with. One is the model of traditional Islam, which fully rejects modernity. This is the model of Sayyid Hussein Nasser. So he seems to live in an imaginary world as if there is no modernity because mm. he thinks modernity is a cultural practice. Modernity is a cultural practice, but there, is, there are fundamental changes. Modernity is a structure of history. It's, it's what some, if Fernand Braudel called the long durée. It's a long structure of history, mm. and it is irreversible. Unless you have a major war and everything is destroyed, we might go back 10,000 years yes. or 5,000 years, but you can't selectively reverse history. So Muslims cannot reverse modernity. Sayyid Hussein Nasser's uh, imagination of a traditional Islam is as if it is unsullied, mm. uh, uncorrupted by modernity, which is which is quite strange. Uh, he is a product of modernity himself. He went to Harvard ah, he didn't, <laughs> and studied and got his yeah. PhD in physics. Bef and he wrote in English most mm -hmm. of his books, published them in the West, enjoyed the freedom that the West provided, enjoyed the political economy of the West, which allowed him to thrive as a scholar. He had to live, leave Iran. And the traditional Iran was not a place where he could have survived. Mm -hmm. so, so my point was in that sentence that you picked up, I'm not advocating for that kind of traditionalism. Uh, I think that traditional response is this rejection of modernity, and the best example is Tablighi Jamaat and Sufi movements who mm -hmm, are not fully yeah. integrated, and they are apolitical, and so, so they can provide you some religious comfort, but they cannot provide you an opportunity to remain autonomous. One of the biggest dangers in this world is that if you are weak, you will be colonized, by imperial powers and you will be exploited. So you have no choice but to acquire mm. power and traditional Islam cannot give you that. And then you have the political Islam response which is obsessed with politics. Their whole concern seems to be that Muslims have lost power and how do we get power? And, and that is where they see the Islamic State as an instrument for power to protect. So their idea is that if we can have the power that an Islamic State can provide, mm. then we can become autonomous, we can shield our society from Western cultural influence. So, for example, um, many of them are opposed to the new trends in Western life, such as LGBTQ. They think that if they had an Islamic state, they would be able to kind of create a watertight society where Western cultural influences will not go. And I, I'm convinced that political Islam has failed horrendously wherever mm -hmm. it has. The only marginal success they have enjoyed is in Iran, in the Shia society, and. Even there, we can talk about how truly uh, political Islamic Iran really is. Uh, and then the third approach is the approach of uh, what we call Islamic modernism. And for a long time, I saw myself as an Islamic 
uh, intellectual who's part of the Islamic modernist movement which accepts modernity uh, and then tries to find ways in which to find Islam and see if it is compatible with modernity and the debates are about Islam and democracy. I've done a whole edited volume on Islam and democracy which is quite well received actually in the Muslim world. So to argue that, that, the, the, that the modern world is not something which is independent of Muslim input and yeah. it is not a place where Muslims would have trouble surviving. They can live in democracies. We are surviving in America, which is a secular I democracy. So, so that was one point. But in this book, I return actually mm. to, to Sufism, but not traditional yeah. form of organized Sufism, but to the concept of Hassan to build my model of Islamic governance. Okay. Uh, I think this is a great uh, perspective, yeah, uh, from Prop Khan. So uh, now I'm going to the second question. The third one. Uh, the third question. In your book, uh, page five, you said Islam is the antithesis of identity. For me, I think it is a really... Uh, it freaked you out. Yes, of course. Yeah, Why? You said that. like that's it. Yeah. So, Islam... If you look at Hassan as described in the famous mm -hmm. hadith of Jibril, Hassan is to worship Allah as mm -hmm. if you see him, and if you cannot see him, remember that he sees you. But one of the goals of Sufism, and or the path of Sufism, is about trying to bring Hassan into your life. Yes. I argue that as to live a life of Hassan, is to live life as if you have made eye contact with God. Mm -hmm. And both you and God are doing the same yeah. function. He's witnessing you and you're witnessing him. Yeah. So that's what the mm -hmm. eye contact is. Okay. Shahid and Mashhud. Shahid is the witness, Mashhud is who is witness. So yeah. we are witnessing God and God is witnessing us. So the point that I'm trying to make is that if you are familiar with the concept of fana, I divide Hassan into seven or eight concepts, and mm -hmm. one of the concepts is fana. Fana is self-negation. It's like saying when you drop a drop of water into the ocean, the drop disappears. I see. Most people think that the drop disappeared into the ocean. Mm -hmm. But what actually happens, Wario, yeah, yeah. is the ocean disappears in the drop. Uh -huh. The ocean yeah. disappears in the drop. When you put a drop of water in the ocean, yeah. that is the concept of fana. There is a verse in the Quran which says, Not, nothing encompasses God mm -hmm. except the heart of the believer. So if you believe in God and you have the heart yeah. of a Mohsin, then you as a drop, when you add it to the ocean, the entire ocean becomes part of that drop. Mm -hmm. So you can't find that drop, can you? Can yes. you recover that drop back from All the right. ocean? No. So the, so the drop has lost its identity completely, right? Yeah. So becoming a Muslim is to lose your identity. To say, I'm an Indonesian, I'm a Muslim, yeah. I'm an American. That is not Sufism or Hassan. So it, it leads to identity politics. So I argue that if you are a Muslim, then it is an antidote to contemporary identity mm -hmm. politics. I see Turks coming to yeah. perform Umrah wearing the Turkish flag yeah. even in the in the Haram. I mean, you think God cares if you are a Turk or not? Yeah. Right? So I right. find that very yes. irritating, bringing your nationalistic identity into the God's house. I find it very disrespectful. Now more and more countries, people are doing that, yes. right? So, so this whole idea of fana is to say, I want to be one with God, and the only way you can be is by self-annihilation. And this is not something new. In, in Surah Al-Rahman, God says, Kullu man alayha fan. Everything that exists will perish. Mm -hmm. What will remain is the majestic yeah. face of God, right? So that is what I mean by saying that Ahsan is the antidote to identity. The problem with political Islam is it's obsessed with identity. Oh, Muslim, non-Muslim, mm, yes. Salafi, non-Salafi, Sufi. And this obsession with identity, so. So all politics is about producing a particular identity. Mm -hmm. You wear a hijab, you're suddenly a pious woman, yes. really? Yeah, you wear a cap and like I'm yes. wearing, you're trying to sing. <laughs> I'm wearing it out of respect for you because this is an Indonesian cap. Oh, nice. But, but the you. point is, the I point see. is that we, we do a lot. You know, you look around my house and there's so much of 
money invested in identity production. Uh, and that is not what Ehsan is. Ehsan is to lose yourself uh, and be one with God, you know, to be one with the one. I see. Does that make sense to you now? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, related with the critical your answer, I think uh, I'm going to the next, for next question. Based on your book, I think in uh, page uh, 163, yeah. you have made a genealogy of the Islamic politic touch, you know. Yeah. We want to know much about this. Can you explain it? So, okay, just to explain genealogy, it will probably take a whole three-hour seminar, mm -hmm. but very briefly, genealogy is a postmodern approach to writing history. And what genealogy necessary? When we used to write history in the past, we used to write history as a grand narrative mm -hmm. with the beginning and the middle and the end, as if there is a telos, we are going towards something. Genealogy tries to, it's like when you have a scatter diagram and you have a line, you know, a yeah. graph, yeah. the line covers dots which are part of the narrative and the other dots are excluded and marginalized. But what you, when you do genealogy, you actually focus on those dots which are not part of the main arc of history that is being narrated. So, so I did a genealogy of Islamic history mm -hmm. to go back and look at how Muslims thought about it. And I think it's one of the longest chapters in the book, and I think everybody who's interested in Islamic political thought, political philosophy should look at it. So what I did was I found that there are five broad approaches to Islamic political philosophy in Islamic tradition. One is the legalistic tradition. I see. Uh, and I took mm -hmm. the example of Mawardi, I see, yeah. the theory of Khalafa. Mm -hmm. There is also the approach of theology. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's approach, yeah. uh, I identified as a theological approach to state. It, it would create a theocracy. Mm -hmm. Then there is what I call as the philosophical approach, which comes from Al-Farabi. Yeah. Uh, it basically, it's Plato adopted into Islamic tradition, the search for the virtuous republic. So Ibn Taymiyyah is trying to establish Sharia. Yeah. Uh, al Mawadi is establishing yes. Khilafah. Yeah. Al-Farabi wants Madinat al-Fadila, the mm -hmm. virtuous republics of philosophy. And the fourth approach is by Ibn Khaldun, who wants to establish a rational state as opposed to a religious state. And then I look at Sheikh Saadi's approach uh, and argue that there is a fifth approach of bringing Ahsan and Sufi values into governance. While they have not articulated a, a political philosophy like a philosopher should, there has been great impact of Sufi thinking on the Mughal Empire and the Ottoman Empire, at least, in Islamic history, mm -hmm. very clearly. You can uh, see Central yeah. Asia and the Ottoman. So what I have done is basically articulated political philosophy as a philosopher would articulate mm -hmm. uh, in Assam. There are a couple of books which talk about, which have come out in recent years, which talk about Sufism and its role in governance, especially with the Mughals and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but that's what I meant by genealogy, to say there's not one way in which Muslims thought of politics. It's not just the Khilafah model, but there were five different streams of thought, not just five individuals. They, I took them as representatives mm -hmm. of each of those schools. So there are five different schools of thought uh, in Islamic tradition. So that's what the genealogy is. Okay, it's nice. Okay, prop. Uh, next question. I think I do really like uh, about your statement in your book. Islamic movement and Islamic state have been failing achieving the goals they had set for themselves: a refall of the Islamic civilization and escape from the cultural and political hegemony of the West. As you stated in your book, for your opinion. Why? Well, I think Muslims have forgotten who God is. They think God is West. I see. Everything is determined by West. I find it so hilarious. What happened? Oh, yeah. America did this. America did this. Yeah. As if America is God and is responsible mm -hmm. for everything. America is quite a failure in trying to influence world okay. politics. But the whole Islamic state is about power. And the most powerful player in the system is America. So their idea of, of getting power is to to be able to nullify America's power over them. So Iran obsessed mm -hmm. with, with the US domination yeah. in the region. If you even look at Hamas, look at Islamic governance. Are the people who are, even in West, West Bank and Gaza, 
people who are governed by Islamists suffer more than people who live mm. under West Bank, yeah. right? Okay. Now, you can say that's because Israel is evil or America is evil or the West is evil. All that is fine. But if you have an Islamic state, why is God not helping you? Or why is God just saying, oh, I'll wait and maybe it, in a hundred years come and help you? That's the whole idea, right? You establish Islamic state, God is with you. Why is God not with people in Gaza? Not that he's with people in West Bank, but certainly not with Gaza. Look at Iran. Iran could have been a great power mm. it had, if it had not decided to become counter-hegemonic yes. too early. So, so look at Iran, China. China is so powerful, the second most powerful country. It hasn't adopted the foreign policy that Iran did as a tiny little regional aspirant for a power, right? Yeah. So what is it about these Islamists that they're more obsessed about power and their people suffer? Look at the Taliban. Today, yeah. one of the countries which is suffering yeah. the most in the world is governed by so-called political Islam, which is the Taliban, mm -hmm. right? So my whole point is that Islamists have not delivered. How long are you going to wait? 150 years. Uh, they have failed, and it's time for us to question. And even the Khilafah model, by God, it has failed. It didn't last even 35 years, right? Yeah. 30 years, that's it. It lasted, and it ended with so many mm. civil wars. If you look at the, f the reign yeah. of the fourth caliph, you had at least three civil wars. It was pretty chaotic. It's not good governance if your mm. society is at war with each other. <laughs> Why don't Muslims ask that question? Yeah. They say, oh, this is the best model of of uh, the Khulafai Rashidin rightly guided, we need to, even the, the first three generations themselves rejected the Khilafah model, right? right? So that is something that people need to critically look at and mm -hmm. examine, and that's the point I'm trying to make. We need to open our minds and focus on governance. What is the point of forcing people to believe in certain things if you are not able to make their lives better? This whole assumption that you may suffer now and you may enjoy life in the hereafter, no. We say Rabbana Tayna Fid Dunya. Yeah. So, Wafil Akhirat. Yeah. Yeah. So, Rabbana Tayna Fid Dunya. Not so, Wafil Akhirat. Not so, Wafina Rabbana. Right? So, we want it to be happy now and in the happy in the hereafter. Okay. It's nice perspective. Yeah. Okay. Pro what nice. is the relevancy? I thought it is profound, man. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go you ahead. really. Uh, I'm just kidding. Okay. What is the relevancy your book say Islam and uh, governance with the current issues, bro? Uh, so, not just in in the uh, United States, but maybe in the broad. So, because I live in the West, yeah. it is not very easy to write from a perspective of a civilization which is sometimes seen as uh, uh, in a state of antagonism, if see, not yes. in competition with mm -hmm. the Western civilization. Uh, so, so for me. It, to be able to write a book which has academic credibility in the West, yeah. uh, and also to be read by scholars, to be it, it's used in universities by many professors mm. uh, yeah, in in the Europe, in the U.S., in Australia, and also in the Muslim world, many professors use it. So for me, that is quite an achievement. But I believe that uh, eventually this this will become. A, a, I hope, I pray that it becomes a major argument. Uh, maybe my solutions are not accepted, but that's fine. But I hope my questions become questions which other people will also address and, and try to answer them. That is my hope with this book. Okay, thank you, bro. I know you are uh, now uh, many books that you have, uh, you write, uh, not just book, I think, but maybe in a journal. Uh, okay. I want to know about the what is next books that you have been uh, writing now maybe you have a plan to yeah uh, see so i am currently involved in doing research about the state of indian mm -hmm. muslims with the rise of hindu nationalism what is going right. to happen to india and uh, so my next book is going to be india related and well, i don't know whether nice. it's yeah. going to be about indian muslims mm -hmm. or whether it's going to be right. about india my initial idea is to write a book about india's grand strategy to look at I suggest you maybe india. you could uh, writing about indonesian uh, politics based on islamic visit. <laughs> well uh, i mean i'm happy to engage with uh, indonesian intellectuals yeah of uh, course like i said i'm familiar with some of their works mm. uh, and uh, but indonesia is is a very good uh, case study to, while you study India because uh, Hinduism thrives yeah, in, yeah. in Indonesia mm -hmm. and there is a syncretism of Hindu and Muslim culture in Indonesia especially mm -hmm. if you go to the island of Bali yeah. 
not just people, the culture, the yeah. language, the yeah. food, the architecture of the homes, and all those big, big statues Many that things, you have. Yes. Are, it, 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 I think Bali is more Hindu than India is. Oh, I see. And, and India oh, is I more see. Islamic in its appearance, if you drive around India, than Indonesia mm. is. So, so, so that is fine. It will be an interesting contrast to draw in that book, inshallah. Nice. Uh, last question, bro. Please give the best practices, yes, uh, for us, yeah. Uh, be a Muslim in the West. Well, why West? Because, uh, yes, there is uh, experience about Islamophobia, no. about, yes, of course. What does God say in the Quran? Hmm. Yakhriju, you know? Yeah. God has extracted you from darkness into light. Uh, yeah. If you are not the most enlightened person in the room, you are not a Muslim. I see. Wherever you are. The most mm -hmm. enlightened person in a room is the Muslim. Not the one who's wearing Indonesian cap. Mm -hmm. Not the one who's yeah. praying in airports and planes. Not the ones who's praying on the streets and get causing inconvenience to thousands of other people. Islam is about enlightenment. In fact, the closest definition of God is Allahu Nurus Samawati Walat. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, right? So we are talking about God as a as light. And being a Muslim is about being enlightened. Therefore, when I reached you must have heard of the Western philosopher who said, I think therefore I am. Yes. Right? But if you type that, it's an incomplete sentence. Mm -hmm. So I say, I think, therefore, I am a Muslim. Which means that if you don't think, you're not a Muslim in my book. All right. Rob, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, Vajio. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, thank you very invite much. Invite me in the next place, in the next library. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I think... I know you're uh, thinking about the Islam and government is very uh, critically, but I understood about this uh, your answer, and of course uh, I think this is uh, uh, can uh, make uh, many opinion after this. But I do really happy you you can uh, give a, a great opinion about the Islam and government. But you forgot one thing. Oh. You forgot to ask your listeners to subscribe to conversation. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay, Allah. don't forget to subscribe. like, share, and subscribe. Oh, that is for his channel. <laughs> But you also have to subscribe <laughs> to Conversations. Yes. And Vario is going to provide the link All to right. Conversations in the description of this video below. Yes. Are you not? Yes. Good. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.